Hello, viewers and listeners. I'm Suresh Shankar, founder and CEO of Crayon Data, an AI and big data company, a podcaster, and host of Slaves to the Algo. Slaves to the Algo is my attempt to demystify the age of data and the algorithm, sharing my learnings and those of other leaders to understand how they are using or being used by the data and algorithms in our personal and professional lives. Slips to the Algo does not attempt to portray our future as either dystopian or utopian. It merely seeks to bring alive the use of data and algorithms more into our conscious thinking selves. And today, uh, it's interesting because I'm talking about a completely different area where data and algorithms are seemingly taking over that world. And that world is the world of sport. And nowhere is the use of data and algorithms more intriguing in some ways in the world of sport, because traditionally, success in sports is always about talent and hard work. But what is increasingly becoming obvious is that data can shed light on why some sportsmen perform better, on how they do it, much as in the way, same way that it's being used to analyze and predict other forms of human behavior, like you know the chances that a person is a good credit risk or why people who like one song will also like another. And that my viewers and listeners, is a thorny issue because we've all been brought up to believe that sports is the last frontier where purity of personal will is the only determinant of success. And to examine how data and algos are increasingly becoming the currency of the world of sport, both on and off the pitch, I am delighted to have today as a guest, Unmish Parthasardi, founder at Pictureboard Partners. Unmish is a fellow cricket tragic. He's uh, actually managed to create a profession from his passion for sport. Um, he started with IMG, the famous IMG, which started the world of sports agency. And he said digital leadership roles in multiple countries in Delhi, London, Dubai, Joburg, Singapore. He's also managed to make a career of traveling the world, trying to do this profession. Um, and he's done this with multiple media and uh, sports uh, councils like the BBC, Star Sports, News Corporation, the ICC, etc. And uh, Unmish likes to describe himself as a person who brings together theses, content, code, and commerce. Our focus today is where does the code drive the content and the commerce? And currently, Unmish has founded Pictureboard Partners because, like he said, he said, let me make a billion instead of just the sportsman making the billion. And it's a practice that's in the gems sectors, gaming, education, media, and sport. And he works for clients like the ICC, the International Cricket Council, one championship, people like Twitch and gaming and Microsoft and, and food channels and, you know, you name it, he's, he does it. And uh, his name is Partha Sardi and he used to travel a lot. And the fun fact is that uh, some airline crews actually learned to pronounce that name. Welcome to the show, Unmesh. Suresh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, we have taken the field uh, often in my background right behind me at the Padang in Singapore. Uh, a big fan of you both on and off the pitch. So thank you very much uh, for having me here. That's very nice. And I was just going to remark on that, that that piece of land out there is probably one of the most valuable pieces of land in the world sitting in the heart of Singapore. And it's such a wonderful thing to play cricket out there like uh, Unmish and I have for, uh, for many years. Anyway, uh, Unmish, I like to start the episode always by asking guests a slightly more personal question. I mean, while we're all professionals and we're affected by developments in technology and data, we're also affected as individuals by developments in AI. And can you share with us some example of a great algo that you've come across that's impacted your life positively or negatively? And in your case, I want you to restrict it. Don't tell me about the Amazon recommendation. I want you to pick something from sports that you just absolutely love or hate. I'm going to give you mine to kick this off. I heard that just before the Rio Olympics, the British cycling team did something and they figured out that if they heated their shots, they get a 4% improvement. They got a 4% improvement in performance, right? So what's your favorite algo in sports? There are enough people who can actually perform better if the heat is in the posterior. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a fair call. Look, you know me long enough, Suresh. I don't take myself seriously, but I do take my work extremely seriously. Uh, and so I'm going to give you three, and I talk in threes, as we'll see in the course of the next 45 minutes to an hour. I'm going to give you two sets of triplets. At a personal level, the three things which have sort of transformed my life. One is LinkedIn. You know, I was an early adopter, which is very rare for me on technologies. I adopted in 2004, or three at business school, way, way back. And today, you know, it's, a, it's my only social media network, and it's phenomenally useful in terms of the information it provides, the, how I connect. And, you know, to your point on the last podcast, where relevance re leads into ecosystems and it has a multiplier effect, a huge, huge piece. Second is Google Alerts. 
every time I'm tracking a particular issue or a particular client or a particular partner uh, or a particular organization, Google Alerts has been tremendously useful in a very time efficient way uh, to be able to sort of help me with that. And lastly, something which you may or may not know, I don't have a driving license. I don't drive. And I haven't for over a decade, uh, whether it's a Tesla or, or something else. But um, my wife, in her eternal wisdom, and I'm very ever grateful, gave me a, an app called Go There, which is a Singaporean app called Go There, which allows me to work out on A to B. I think the public transport is very good in Singapore. So whether it's by, uh, by taxi or by bus or by train, as the case might be. So that's the only reason I get back home at night. So that's on the personal front. On the professional front, I think the three biggest sort of um, uh, algorithms which uh, are very much technologies of this decade, uh, which we work a lot with our clients and partners. One is computer vision. I think computer vision has got tremendous scope. We, we began working uh, in 2015. My second client was a company called Blipper, and they were looking at computer vision and all that kind of stuff, machine learning. Um, and then since then, we've sound, you know, worked with companies like Stupa in India and worked with some other companies as well, who are doing some phenomenal work around sponsorships and player tracking and all that kind of stuff using an Android smartphone, that's it, as opposed to, you know, something which is worth 400 bucks as opposed to $40,000. So that just democratizes, you know, knowledge and the dispersion of knowledge, which is very, very big. And we'll talk about that. Capturing knowledge and dispersion, huge, huge difference there. So computer vision is one. The second is, I think, uh, what I broadly call mixed reality. I wouldn't say augmented or, or, or virtual, as the case might be, or, or the M word. But, but you know, I, th I think mixed reality has got tremendous applications. Um, you know, whether it's security, whether it is in surgery, as the case might be, but also in terms of sport, both on and off the pitch, you know, for the athlete and for the fan, as, as we probably will talk about. And the third piece is machine learning in the audio space. So, you know, a lot has been spoken in the last decade about over the top OTT and video, Netflix, and, or Amazon Prime Video and news feeds and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. But I've been tracking OTT audio for the last sort of five years um, and much more on the on the on the on the linear non-linear audio side rather than the music playlist side and there's a company in delhi called kabri <clears throat> which is mm -hmm. sort of founded by the found former one of the far former founders of savan which was bought by geo and reliance and they have basically begun as kabri of course means news or happenings in hindustani and hindi but they pivoted during covid into an education business and if you look at you know the the the, the, the negative correlation between literacy and education especially in emerging markets where you don't have to be literate to get become educated. Huge, huge, massive impact. So computer vision in terms of, you know, all the sort of elements you can provide around sport, performance, sponsorships, all that kind of stuff. Mixed reality in terms of providing and engaging millennials such as, you know, and, and Gen Zs. And I think we have a sample size of one living with us as our daughter uh, and, and machine learning, but more on the OTD audio side. So those are sort of three things that is a big focus for us uh, for this decade as well. And that's um, an extremely interesting thing, including the fact that I just discovered that you don't drive. You used to be able to play the cover drive well, though. So that is <laughs> at least one drive that you could play. Um, let, let me just say this. Let, let, let me just say this. Uh, being a, always, I've always driven on the right side of the road, uh, and the left hand is very important on the gear shift. Unfortunately, it doesn't, that doesn't translate to my batting. So the bottom hand is too strong. So the cover drive is, you know, I, I appreciate the compliment, but, uh, you know, I, I, it's, uh, it's, it's been a rarity occasion. Anyway, to come back to, I think, uh, one of the things that you picked about, which is computer vision, right? And, you know, uh, I think when I look at uh, algos and data and sports, uh, you know, broadly, I think there are multiple ways in which it impacts it. One is what I would call, um, when we discuss this, you know, the on the pitch. How does this actually influence the way coaches, players use it to improve performance on the field of play in different sports? And the second one, obviously, is the increasing use of data and algos off the pitch or off the field which is the commercial aspects of it, how are people, you know, value being placed on things, et cetera. And perhaps, you know, we should uh, start with the on the pitch side of this, because that's really where I think the whole clash between, or is there a clash between man and machine data and people come in, right? And one of the things, like I said, in, in, you know, you talked about computer vision and we live in an era where, you know, digital technology is like, you know, people are basically filming everything in sport. And a coach has today, earlier a coach would be, basically driven by what he saw with his eyes and ears or her eyes and ears. Now we have a battery of coaches, but now we have another set of eyes and ears to improve team performance, spot something, how are people playing something? When should a person be pulled off? Like, let's say, 
a football thing and when should a person be you know substitute be brought on etc so what kind of can you give us some examples of various sports of how computer vision or the soul analysis is being used to actually improve on field performance so no great question so uh, let, let's break down the the on field piece into three things right i think that three pain points or objectives that algos can provide as far as the on pitch um, dynamic of sport is concerned one is discovery you know how do you discover talent or elements of talent you know i was reading an article about the ipl auction who can actually play the googly better and who can play the googly better in the first six overs or in the power play than afterwards you know that's discovery and then you know, you find somebody from way beyond because of the data saying that these guys actually are better against left arm spin with the new ball coming around the wicket so i think discovery is one i think refinement is the other where once you've got the talent you burnish the talent and, you know you polish it to make it make it match ready and then the third aspect is performance because just as you as a batsman or a bowler uh, have access to eyes and ears as you say so does the competition so you know how do you continue to evolve as a player as all of us have to, as professionals as well and and individuals and persons in life as well so i'd say discover refine compete or discover refine perform i think those are the three primary buckets that are that typically sort of tend to situate the on pitch use of data and algorithms and when you look at that so for example let me take the perform bit because that's the one that's interesting to me um let me take um, you know cricket which is a game we both play and you know today in many of the things people are being told we extensively analyze this batsman we know that if he comes on a play you got to bowl a particular kind of bowler against him or even tell a even it's not just a left arm spinner bowl the ball just at this particular length on this particular line keep it there and you know he's going to make a mistake um on the other hand the batsman is going out there i presume the batsman side as you're saying is also telling him listen you don't do this pretty well watch out for something that comes in this is where the bowler likes to bowl to get it now in a way um, you know like i said this goes against the fundamental skill that as a player and again it doesn't matter whether it's cricket or football i'm getting out there and my feel for the game i mean i know all of this my mind is also already a, a supercomputer calculating all these odds and, and adjusting it to play right so where does the the data in this help and where does it also start to hinder performance how much do i get messed up in my mind because i know the bowler is going to do this or you know take a spot kick i mean like you know everybody is told the goalkeeper goes one way the goalkeeper goes another way how much where does all this like you know like i said the use of data help you where does it you know hinder you as as an athlete so i think i think there there's a there's a balance between uh, intuition and insight right fundamentally Uh, and intuition is something where there's muscle memory uh which is important right so you know how do you as you said hit a cover drive or how do you get the corner of the uh, of the goal post when taking a spot kick the the inside bit is how you actually manage your intuition and your muscle memory in a moment where it's not muscles but is actually the nervous energy and the moment which actually is creating a lot of noise for you so i think you you need to situate the ability to perform an action as opposed to bringing that action to bear to achieve something in the moment you know again if you break it down from intuition to insight it it makes a lot of sense it's like a lot of good students are not good examiners but a lot of high achievers in a highly academic environment are good students and good examiners classic example right so uh, and if you, and i'll give you two other examples to sort of compare and contrast this right the heart and the mind kind of thing if you look at cullinan and warn famously he was warn's bunny right that battle was lost in the mind very early on and this was before some microphones went up and the legend of warn was there and all that kind of stuff happened if you look at warner and broad you know he's been working on him in different ways on different kinds of pitches in different kind of countries um around the wicket over the wicket you know whether it's just short of length or whether it's going going across him is it a full length or a short ball and how you set him up a lot of times people tend to forget that dismissal in cricket is not a silver bullet it is some of the parts of what preceded it i was just watching the uh, india england on 19 uh final last night and there was a very crucial wicket that happened where the english player who was batting number 4 got 95 had taken the score from nothing to something the opposing batsman had a maiden over 
And the first ball, the next over, this guy got out. And that just turned, turned the match. So instead of chasing 180, 190, it became, or instead of chasing 260, 280, it became a 190 chase. Huge difference. So the point I'm trying to make here is that intuition is important, insight is important. The only difference is that insight allows you to zero down on a particular moment in time with a certain set of circumstances, which are predefined. And there, uh, that's where data comes I'm, from. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to narrow in on a little bit of sharply on what you just said, right? I think we've always known that, right? We've known that some people are certain bunnies, even without, before even anything like data existed. I knew when I went out of bat that some guy is going to bowl like this, or when I'm bowling that some guy prefers to play it out here. So you have your own set of data in the previous world, which is based on some level of observation with your eyes and ears. What seems to now have happened is that you are supplementing that with a huge amount of actually computer vision and analytical data saying, this is yeah. exactly what's happening, right? Yeah. And, um, and that to me is, uh, for example, if you take football, I mean, it, it's a game I know we both follow. You know, the way you press a team, like, you know, the way Klopp's teams press or Guardiola's teams press, they almost say, when you do this, we know the opposition is going to react like this, right? So that's, I guess, the question. Now you're being told as a sportsman, on top of what you already know, I'm going to tell you to do this. And as a, as a sportsman, now I'm being told it's not my talent. It's not only my intuition and all of that, but I'm now being given a set of data, right? So how do people, you've talked to some top sportsmen in the world, you've done that stuff. How do people react to this whole thing of saying, I'm going to get an input on data, bowl like this? I'm like, I'm a bowler. I've been trained to do this all my life. You're telling me you can do better? So there's that, um, you know, how does that actually work in reality today? Are people, are players open to data? Um, how do coaches interact with them on this kind of stuff? Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to sort of answer this question in two different lenses. Let's talk about the player first. Right. And if you look at the last 20 years and you go across from west to east, right, pick baseball, basketball, pick European football and you pick cricket. The volume and variety of that sport that an athlete has to play on an annualized basis and in the course of a 10 year career has been a huge multiple. Right. At the same time, the market dynamics on the price of talent and the risk of injury and insurance premiums has also gone up. So I'm putting to, again, this context of how do you optimize an asset? That's my first point. My second point is because players realize that, you know, professional careers are, you're always a second away from an ACL, which will see you out of the game. And that's all you've done since you were 10. Conversely, if you play well for even five years, you're done for life. Therefore, to your point about receptivity of players, and the, you know, the social mores or the lack thereof, which allow them to be open to data uh, is much more because the stakes are high for them too, which wasn't the case a decade ago for in, in the sport of cricket, for example. I think, I think the IPL has changed that, just as the Premier League changed a lot of it in football, right? That's my second point. And my third point is keep in mind that performance is not necessarily only a function of a player or an athlete. It begins all the way from when the player is bought. So we have the IPL auction next weekend. There are significant calls being made, a million here, a million there. It's a big call being made, right? You have a $10 million budget. How do you play with that? That's a huge piece, which will play out over 36 months. So that decision-making also is very important because it fits into, as you were saying, what's your larger game plan? Like Klopp, you know, it took him three years for Liverpool to actually get onto a phenomenal ride, like Dortmund. So I'm making three points. I think one is in terms of volume and variety. Two is the stakes and therefore on pitch and along pitch stakeholders and how they are using that a lot more in terms of the economics of the sport. And the third is therefore the general receptivity and therefore the magnitude and the frequency with which data is being used uh, is exponential. And I get that. I'm just thinking I'm a sportsman. I'm a simple guy. Most sportsmen are young. I'm 19. I'm 20. I've been told I've trained hard. I play this. Um, I am now being told to go out on a pitch. Let's again take cricket or baseball, which are singular games. And I'm just told this ball, whatever it is, don't bother about everything else. Just go and try and hit this down for six. Or I'm a bowler and I'm told just bowl it outside the off some. Don't worry about the consequences. Isn't that go against the very ethos of what a sports, you know, that, that whole combat thing is where I'm supposed to work this out. I'm playing with somebody else, right? Uh, but the tactics are kind of completely dictated by what your analyst is telling you. And 
doesn't that take away a little bit from the magic of the moment in sport so i think there's a difference between serendipity and magic right serendipity is when you sort of see the tea leaves and you you see the macros coming together and you place yourself magic as as a fan and you can see that as a fan you can see as as a talent scout you can see that as an agent you can see that as a broadcaster you can see that as a brand seeking ambassadors you can see that as a coach of course a serendipity i can sort of see that where this is going right rishabh pant was a big deal uh you know so how do you sort of see that coming through then there's magic where we don't quite know how somebody does a performance right which to my mind is actually the the essence of sport right uh the converse argument is was da vinci an artist or a scientist was steve jobs an artist or a scientist a lot of art and the music I mean, music topology is historically and numerically driven right but the beauty of a symphony the beauty of a rag depending on you know, whether it's komola or tigra and all that kind of stuff is based on a mathematical cadence it's just that it's not taught as such and the perception as a consumer of that content is not that oh it is being defined by data i think it's being enabled by data but the human agency is never lost and to my mind actually today there's an even bigger chance of magic for two reasons a you'll have your pravin tambes of the world coming out of nowhere to perform because they've been picked using data but also you will sort of see a lot of players playing well into their 30s because the biomechanics that they've got which is all behind the scenes which is don't something you see on the court or on the pitch is being taken care of in terms of the longevity so to my mind to be able to have federer for an additional decade you know when jordan came and went i think it's a huge piece as a fan it just increases the window of of magic so i think there's a distinction between serendipity and magic there's a distinction yes. between longevity of performance and frequency of performance and i'm going to go back to the first one of serendipity and magic because it's such a beautiful way to kind of talk about this use of data and that right uh, again i'm going to pick football just so that we keep the audience thing there's a moment when you give the ball to mohammed salah of liverpool just outside the box on the right uh, where he basically you know that he is going to kind of cut and dip his left shoulder dip his right shoulder go past you as a defender i presume your told that this is what is going to happen the data exists i mean if you and i can see it as fans those guys who have paid a lot of money millions of dollars can do it now where is that moment when you know you're going to get it done and you still get not met you know <laughs> how does that is that i mean is that the difference where you have the data but you know both sides have the data right and then you know one side is still going to win that thing would that be the difference i mean you know is that the kind of thing you're talking about in talk about the magic that a sportsman still has beyond the data let me let me put this into a macro context i question whether both types have the data going back in time if you track the creation of messi right all the way through a very formal system at barcelona and someone like salah or the entire generation of african players especially the french african players who come through who came through a purely what i call magical non numerical system right that's a classic example of where the defender and the coach who's basically trying to work out you know what salah will do next based on the data of the last 5 years is forgetting that there's an in, there's an intuitive part of salah which is 15 years old for which there's got no reflection but if you look at data now and it take let's say over the last 10 years sports and starting with the whole moneyball revolution and net silver and all the people who did baseball where it, a lot of this started I think there's more and more data available, right? If you take cricket, for example, on T20, though I know T20 is about, it's about 13 years, 14 years old, but there's been so much data available. Surely that's not such a big issue. And you know, when the data is available to everybody, and today it is, right? I can go on Quickbus and do my own analysis. Uh, I can go on to Analytic Five. You know, there's a whole bunch of things where you can do all of this stuff, right? Um, where is the? Is it now going to be the coach or the analyst? and there's actually guys right there's this guy prasanna agora who's on a speed dog there's dananjay there's a lot of people who have actually gone out there and literally made superstars into superstars and you never know about these guys so you know how how does this all are we going to see the coach analyst as fundamentally that algorithm that's sitting behind and becoming as famous or as rich as the sportsman himself great question and again I, i i would i'm a very i'm a very one dimensional person so i will go back to cricket and i make two points 
One, if you look at, you know, the recent Ashes series in Australia, and the, the, a lot of the press coverage after that, you know, the argument has really been, have we gone too far on the data to ignore the individual performance, which is intuitive and in the moment, especially for a format like test cricket, which over 20 hours has a cadence like no other sport. Uh, compared to Peter Moores, who famously gave this one-line answer in a press conference, which led to him eventually you know, exiting as England coach, saying, I'll have to look at the data. Which, you know, it always happens in the cadence of the adoption. You know, sort of, you certainly have the early majority. And then when you get to the late majority, there's suddenly a bit of a recalibration of saying, what is this mix that we're looking at? Uh, and, and so long as there's sanity in using that, uh, and by, by sanity, I mean sporting sanity, commercial sanity, and psychological sanity, then it makes sense. My second point is, I've got a quiz question for you. I'm wearing a t-shirt with an equation. I was going to ask you about that one. <laughs> is, that, is, that where, is that where the IPL auction is going to be held? I mean, is that No, it's not. Thing? This is an equation which is more than two decades old. Mm -hmm. This was an equation which was used at the 99 World Cup. This was an equation which began with deep research of two academics, and then they actually add, had to add a third academic. Mm -hmm. This is the Duckworth-Lewis Stern equation. Is that so? Okay. Right. So I this is the Duckworth-Lewis Stern equation, especially for you, Suresh, especially for sales slaves. For That's Arnold. interesting. That's interesting. Right. Now, you think about what I said about sanity. You know, sanity of, or you know, sporting sanity, commercial sanity, and the psychological sanity of a player. Because people forget, you know, a lot of sport, a lot of memories is of a shelf life of someone who's not thought of anything but that sport for 25 years, has been tremendously lucky on multiple angles to give us those magic moments. And then they go away. So the sanity of the, of, of the sports, of the athlete is very, very important. Now, Duckworth Lewis is fundamentally defined to impact rain impacted, to, to solve for rain impacted matches at the 1999 World Cup in England, which was held in the month of May, June. And at the time when, you know, rain was still a big factor. And I think all of the games were day games, if I recall correctly. The lights weren't quite there by then. So this was about how algorithms and maths allows you to provide sanity across the board for the player, for the commercial partners, for the fans, you know, for the government supporting and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a balance, as I was saying, on the Ashes piece where there's going to be a correction. You know, they're talking about... You know, doubling down on the red ball, but it fundamentally means that you're doubling down to a far more sophisticated cadence. You know, it's like being a hedge fund using data as opposed to doing uh, an asset manager doing a block trade. You know, hedge fund is from the margin, very reactive, all that kind of stuff. Block trade is fundamentally it's a strategic play. Underlying both of these these trades is fundamentally maths and a lot of money. You know, we in the in the last two years have probably advised. Five different clients on block trades, which is interesting. You know, they're making big calls on certain technologies in the sort of gaming sport media space and saying, how, you know, we've done the model, come and pick holes in our known unknowns. So that to me, you know, that, that's kind of important because that's a sanity from an investor perspective. Well, there's an extremely fascinating thing by the former Greek um, finance minister who actually for a period of time used to advise this gaming company called Valve, about how exactly the use of, um, let's say, how people put in these things like digital hats and swords and how you know these trades happen and how economic value is placed. So clearly, um, there's a whole bunch of data that's going into practically li literally every industry. Uh, and it, but but I, I, I come back to, do you believe that magic is being lost with the use of data? Or do you think that actually it is being enhanced by the use of data? Um, simple question. Uh, magic has been lost and created. For every, for every moment when you have a broad working out of Warner, who to my mind is a phenomenal cricketer. Don't forget, he came in through the IPL route to make a mm -hmm. phenomenal test career, right? So even the most numerous system like Sheffield Shield Cricket and the Great Cricket in Australia, you know, who were amongst the earliest adopters of data, couldn't find him. And then you know, it was really IP with a surface hit. On the other hand, you know, magic has been created. Magic has been created by the different kinds of uh, plays that that uh, different kinds of coaches using players of a very variable talent 
level are being able to create for the fan, which I think is very important for the sport. For any sport to be able to come up with a consistency of magic moments is fundamental to the economic value and the societal impact that that sport has. So on the one hand, the, the traditional magic is being lost, as you said, you know, which is which is very much the, <clears throat> the art, not science. But on the other hand, I go back to my point about topology of music, you know, or the use of 3D printing in ceramics and sculptures, where you're using science to create an expression which would not have been possible had it not been for the data and the underlying technology which is creating it. To come back to one last question that I think uh, on the on the pitch side, and I think this is um, um, kind of very relevant to a lot of fans who follow cricket. And this guy is probably one of the, the best known sportsmen in the world, though he plays this game that's called that's not known in many parts called cricket, which is uh, Dhoni. I have not seen a person. Do you think Dhoni uses data? I mean, first of all, do you think he even looks at the data? <laughs> because he doesn't seem to look at anything except. I'm just going to be calm, no matter what happens. I'm not going to change my formula. I mean, look, I mean, I'm not he's, going to do I'm, anything I'm, differently. I'm a huge fan of him. I was fortunate enough, I think so were you, to be in Wankade in 2011 uh, for the World Cup final. That was ice and veins kind of a moment, right? Um, and uh, I, I would like to think that, you know, performers, I don't think, I don't think he's a sportsman, I think he's a performer. I think performers are on a different level. You know, they don't necessarily look at, you know, intuition or insight or instinct like we do as in a discrete piece. You know, they, they just they just compose a symphony by just picking things out of out of thin air. Uh, so I'll give you an example. Was the decision to promote himself ahead of UB? You know, was he sitting with a calculator and Gary Kirsten and Paddy? No way. Right. I was at the IPL uh, semi-final this this year, uh, last year in Dubai, and he came out ahead of Jadeja with three overs to go, and I'm like, he's lost it. <laughs> What's he doing? He's not the guy he was, and he made 16 runs in four balls, right? <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> but you know, and my whole point is, you know, 16 runs of four balls, as he quite rightly says, as opposed to whatever he made, 80 yard or 70 yard in the World Cup final, uh, which is a very different piece altogether. But my point is, you know, performers at that level are like performers at most levels, be it, you know, entrepreneurship such as yourself, be it medicine, be it defense, be it education. You know, the, 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 their playbook is so, so simple yet a sophisticated mix. It is sophisticated in the value that they are able to create and is simple in terms of them being able to explain the capturing of that value. You know, any, any, any value proposition is two things. You create value, you capture value. If you don't do both, Often you can simply capture it and make it very sophisticated in terms of you know how you how you how you sell it, which is where ad agencies make their money. Which, which, which brings me to literally you're both, you're also been of the broadcasting business. Now if you take any sports broadcast, any sport in the world, mm -hmm. there's a pre there's a pre uh, uh, pre broadcast and there's a post immediate analysis during the halftime or the lunch break or whatever. It's always experts, sportsmen who played the game. And they've got these sophisticated visual things. They're saying this is what happened, and they look at yeah. this move, and they're trying to yeah. put all these graphics and predict all that analysis. How much of that is, uh, you know? I mean, I know it's it's nice, and it like kind of tends to give an area of science to this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm just wondering, one, did these guys ever do it? I know maybe the technology wasn't <laughs> as sophisticated when they were playing, but do players actually go out and listen to that uh, thing, or is it all just like you know nice? <laughs> Broadcasting technique. Yeah, look, multiple questions there. Let me let me unpick that again. I'll do threes. When you're looking at a uh, when you're looking at a sports broadcast, you are trying to satisfy three primary constituents, right? You're trying to satisfy the fan. You're trying to satisfy your media partner, and you're trying to satisfy the future fan, right? So existing fan, I want to media partner, commercial partner, and future fan. The the, the current fan you need the credibility of players. A number of commentators who haven't played T20 cricket, who are commentating on T20 cricket, goes back to your first point. But it brings credibility on day one. So that's, that's one piece of the puzzle, right? The other piece is in terms of satisfying your commercial partners is about staying relevant in being able to tell a story. It's a broad cast. It's not a narrow cast. So you've got to have the players. You've got to have the stats. You've got to have the augmented reality set. You've got to have the high-definition video. And you've got to have the music which goes backwards and forwards. 
all of which comes together fundamentally to address four or five different segments, or as we always call it, you know, the fanatic, the fan, and the follower. That's my second point. A broadcast is fundamentally a portfolio play of interest groups, right? The third piece is ensuring future fans. Now, that's where I think this whole notion of bringing the fan closer to the action, whether it is, you know, augmented reality or mixed reality, as I mentioned, we work with a company in Bombay called Quidditch Innovation Labs. You know, they are the ones who actually do the field positionings on cricket, which you can't show on a live broadcast in camera one, right? Or you look at, you know, in the, in the fair, I think 2018 World Cup, where VizRT came up with this in-studio graphic set where the former captain of a particular team who was in the panel actually walked out 180 degrees into a green screen, positioned himself to where the defenders were lining up for a free kick and said, this is actually where they didn't anticipate the move. Mm-hmm. Now, that is no different than a Dota 2, going back to your Greek finance minister and Val, where it's fundamentally immersive stuff. And instead of actually providing skins in a game and an avatar, you're fundamentally taking the old retired sports person into a current day scenario to tell something about what they did in the first person visually so that it actually appeals to the next generation who are fundamentally Roblox natives as opposed to digital natives. So, you know, I think that there are multiple pieces in your questions. I've tried to answer it as usual and in I three, but hopefully it begins to answer that. No, I think it deconstructed it well, but, um, you know, I think we could go on forever on this whole on the pitch thing. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I know you're the guest on the show and you're the expert and I'm not, but um, I'm just going to give my own thing, partly as a sportsman, partly as a person sitting in AI, right? Um, I think, for example, when you're, and I think the same thing is true, whether you're a sportsman or an entrepreneur. You have playbooks, you have the data, you have what everybody did, you know what you're supposed to, you know what metrics are supposed to drive. But whether you're an entrepreneur, but I think even more so in the world of sport, one thing I have at least always felt is when you go out there, and this is perhaps what you describe as a magic, it is still fundamentally down to the level of skill that that person has to be able to execute that. You know, whether it's ice in your veins or whether it's just your innate ability to kind of add magic to, you know, to add like, you know, you got the, the, the whole data, but you've got to add your instinct. And my own belief, uh, Unmesh, is that that will never change in sport because that split second, there is nothing there to help you except you and your mind and that moment of clarity that you need. And uh, so while I do believe in keeping with the theme of this, that data can help us uh, become better masters of this game, I don't think the sportsman will ever be a slave to an algorithm. What's your take on that? I totally agree with you. I'll give you, and then let's go back to your comparison of entrepreneurship and sporting performance. The historical hardwired uh, embedded anticipated um, notion of sporting performance is success. The historical embedded uh, misnomer about entrepreneurship is one of failure. If you look at the lack of structure in entrepreneurship and sport, it is the same. If you look at the maths involved in terms of somebody from Rachi, you know, playing a phenomenal World Cup winning innings in 1980s India, but 20 years later actually being king of the castle, as opposed to, you know, Suresh Shankar leaving behind a phenomenal advertising career, starting something called Red Pill and having an exit. But the numbers don't stack up, right? But inherently, there's a sense of expectation of success in a sporting performance, which is where the magic comes in, right? Why is entrepreneurship today succe- uh, uh, socially acceptable in, in India? Because they like, have role models. I like the way enough role models. me and Dhoni in the same sentence, but that's okay, I'll take it. Well, you know, it's kind of, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've covered one and I've played with the other. But I, I think the notion really is, the notion really is that it is, it is, it is the power of an individual and the ability of the individual to read the tea leaves, going back to my original point, and create value and capture value in an institutionalized manner, right? Which is the same in sport. It's totally unstructured data. There is no pathway to success. There are many playbooks which are massively subjective. Um, I I, I, I have this big emerging theory that the playbooks of data and sport for male sports is not going to be the same in female sports. And it's been proven in golf. It's been proven in tennis. It's going to come to team sports. But then my point is, I'm agreeing with you that, that the expectation of magic uh, and the idea of intuition overriding insight every time 
in sport will continue. Sport is unscripted drama. Entrepreneurship is an unscripted career. If I join a co corporate career as an analyst, I know that in 20 years time, play my cards right and luck is on my side. I can be a CEO. Yet There's today, no guarantee in that in entrepreneurship or sport or any performing art. Yet today they're trying to script uh, even how scripts are written and like, you know, what the magic formula for all of that is. Um, I think we can keep talking about this all day long when it's about how exactly data is being used to enhance performance on the pitch. I do know we also have um, another wonderful uh, chat ahead of us in terms of how data is being used by sport uh, off the pitch, if you will, in terms of the economics of this. Uh, what I'd like to do is probably kind of uh, uh, end this episode with this portion and come back and do another one where we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so to my viewers and listeners, thank you for listening to us today. Uh, this is the first part of two on how data and AI is being used in the world of sport. We talked about how it's being used to enhance on-pitch performance and all the different components of that. Um, and uh, I'm delighted that Unmesh will be back to discuss with me in the next episode how data will be used to actually alter the economics of sports. Slaves to the Algo is available on YouTube, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. We release a new episode every week, sometimes more frequently. And if you really like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember that data is taking over everything, including sport. And for more on that, we'll be back with Unmush in the next episode. See you all next week.